Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. In today's podcast, we're going to cover seven tips to increase the likelihood your script will work on multiple computers. Hey, everyone. It's Joe Glines here out of Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jackie here from Copenhagen, Denmark. And uh, today, as we just mentioned, we're going to cover seven tips to increase the likelihood your scripts work on multiple computers. Now, some of these examples here are going to be very specific to AutoHotKey, but a lot of this stuff is still a general practice. So even if you're not an AutoHotKey user, which you should be, um, I would suggest you still listen to this podcast. And the other thing I'd say is please, please like the video. Just like it right now. We'd really appreciate it. Or the podcast, wherever you're doing it. It helps us out. Absolutely. I'd love to have you do that. So the very first one for me, now this one, I, I think it's a little kind of loosey-goosey, but it, it does, I think, especially with nowadays, and if I remember right, Jackie, maybe you've read this, version two of AutoHotKey, everything is Unicode, if I remember correctly. But um, in the, the version we're currently using, version one, you can get it as ANSI or 32-bit and 64-bit. So we recommend using the 32-bit Unicode version of AutoHotKey just because there's a lot of libraries and objects and things out there that don't work with the 64-bit and internationally doing stuff in ANSI is just a, a, a why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I'd say the same thing. And the reason we're recommending 22-bit is exactly as you said, you know, there, there's just too many examples and stuff like that that you would limit yourself from by choosing 64-bit. And more of, more often than not, you wouldn't notice. But as soon as you get a bit more advanced, there's no reason to have that as, as a limiting factor. Well, one case, if, I mean, the point of this podcast is about sharing your script on multiple computers. And not everyone's running 64-bit version of Windows. So if you have your script, whether you compile it or not, but they're using, you know, if it's, well, sorry, if it's compiled in 64-bit and they have a 32-bit version of Windows, they can't run it. But if they have a 64-bit version of Windows, they can still run the 32-bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's a great point for the first one. I'd say the second one would be keep it simple, right? Keep your GUI minimal, Keep keep everything uh, no larger than needed. Right? You, you can make a GUI that's very busy very quickly. Try to either tab it or have it open multiple GUIs or have things in settings or in any files and stuff like that. But yeah, in general, try and keep it simple because the more uh, simple you make it, the simpler it is to maintain and the simpler it is for uh, the people you're trying to share it with to use, but also for you to debug if they're having an issue. And so, yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to add on to that and I'm going to use an example of this of quick access pop-up, which everyone probably is tired of me talking about. It's an amazing tool. However, it is so, has so much built-in functionality. Now, Jean has spent a lot of time troubleshooting in the snap, but it's so complex, the users themselves get confused and don't know how to use it, I, th I think. So having tools that are just more focused and maybe do less, but have multiple different versions can help users adopt your tool. And because most of us want a tool to like kind of go viral, right? Have the chance of really being a big success and the more things you put in it, the harder it is for people to adopt. And so keeping it simple really helps nail that one thing that you do or, or three or four things that you do and not 80 things that you do. Um, the next one, which now Jackie and I talk a lot about this, is uh, generally speaking, there's two approaches to uh, a way to divide things in auto hotkey or any, any tool in this matter uh, that you automate things. There's like looking for images or sending keystrokes. And then there's real API ways like a DLL call or COM or the UI automation or the ACC library, right? Programmatic ways to interact with computers uh, programs. And all, you know when it's available, use that API type approach, not the sending of keystrokes and um, looking for pictures because you're just asking for trouble when you go that route, when you're using yeah. it on multiple computers. Yeah, and that's the exact thing with it, where with 
um, the the calm right with Microsoft products, and now they are moving into um, browser based versions of of their programs and stuff like that. So again, we probably need to need to learn new approaches to that as well, but. With Dell calls on your Windows computer, whereas if you call that Dell and that is supported on the version of Windows that your users or the ones you're sharing it with or the computers you are using, um, you're just going to have such a much higher success rate with having your stuff work. Where with images, even though you have the same resolution, even though you have the same locations of everything, apparently just having a different graphics card, having um, an antivirus program running on one of the computers and stuff like that can give you issues. So yeah, absolutely. Try and use the programmable way, use the API of whichever program you're trying to, to automate. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would even say that it's um, <clears throat> the speed as well is just crazy of a difference. It'd be a fun thing to benchmark sometime, Jackson. We should we should try t- automating the same approach using calm versus keystrokes, and that speed difference it, it will blow your mind. Right? It's just such a difference. Yeah, and and one of the things that it gives you it, when you move away from how a human would do it into how I do it with the computer. Um, you also get the ability to run your programs in the background, have stuff happen so quickly that a user or the screen doesn't have to keep up with um, updating and stuff like that. One of the things you can turn off in Excel and other things, but just the fact that you don't need to have the thing you're interacting with up front and center will most of the time speed it up. That's, that's a that's a really good point, Jackie, because I know firsthand from doing stuff both with IE and with Excel, from turning off the screen and doing the stuff in the background, I had n- no idea the speed difference would be so drastic. It was enormous, um, and, and it's, it's night and day. It's crazy, the difference. And it's all still using Calm, right? It's just... The fact that you're not displaying all the changes and everything, um, when you have to display it and then wait for your you know, your thing to react to it, and then the extra programming you got to do to tackle the stuff, it's just a lot of work. So, yeah, um, there's some good yeah. advantages. Yeah, exactly. And, and we have the fourth one here where don't assume anything. Right? It, 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 it might sound very, very um, a big thing to say, but it is the best way of putting it because – you can't assume that something on one computer will absolutely work on another. And we just talked about the API stuff. Small differences, even in the version of the same version of Windows, <laughs> which is a weird way, but the update version on the Windows you're on. I've had this with Windows 10 quite a bit, whereas Windows 10... 1908 versus Windows 10 2021, um, stuff like that would um, not have the exact same way of doing stuff with their APIs. Most of the time, because I'm on a newer version than the computer I'm trying to share it with. So I had the most up-to-date version of Windows and I had functionality available to me that I sadly assumed that my um, users would also have, which they didn't because for some reason they didn't have the newest version of Windows or they were even on an older version of Windows where it wasn't even available. So yeah, don't assume stuff like that. And use built-in variables, right? For paths, you have in our hotkey, you have the A program files, a windier, a username, stuff like that. When doing specific things, our hotkey will keep track of it for you. So you don't need to know exactly where the program files are or where a user's my documents folder is. 
stuff like that because you can run into different type of uh, issues when you put stuff in locations that Windows deem on safe. Let's say someone actually downloads your program and unpacks it all in the download folder. Windows will immediately limit that program because stuff in the download folder comes from the internet and thereby it's probably less safe than if it was something you had in my document folder. So it can be a really great idea to have either a way for people to install it or make sure that your stuff actually moves away from those areas, my program files, my download folder and stuff like that. And what I would throw on top of that, Jackie, sorry for interrupting, is uh, the one that that I often was uh, um, a perpetrator Perpetuer? No, I don't know, the, whatever. Uh, but I would do this myself was I almost everywhere I worked, I was an admin on my computer. But in a, especially corporate America, a lot of people are not admins on their computers. And it's very easy to forget that, you know, not everyone is, has admin rights to their computers. And that can really throw a wrench in what you're doing <laughs> big time. Yeah, absolutely. Because either you're on making on your own computer or if you're making it for colleagues or if you're making it in a work environment or whatever, your different types of, of uh, rule sets um, are almost impossible to know beforehand. And we have a, another one under here. Don't assume stuff like the working directory, right? Use the ability in our hotkeys to set it, right? It, it's It's if if you make sure to have settings like that in your script, so you're not just assuming that you're running it from the place that you would expect. No, take that time and set a specific working directory, either the one it's run from or whatever it is that you need, but don't assume that they're running it the same way that you did. So, yeah, I've run into problems with that myself because I'll use QAP as a launcher of things and I, I load it and it launches, but I didn't set the working directory and it will not want to work. And I'm like, what's going on? Oh, I need to go in there and tell it to use that specific directory of where it is because things end up breaking. So yeah, it's, it's a good one to have into your script. Um, and then another one, just because, and, and this is becoming more and more of a thing where people have 4K monitors, uh, but Instead of just, it, or, and, and other people are using crappy laptops, and instead of just assuming, I'm going to make a GUI like this size, and it's going to look great everywhere, you know, get the dimensions of the screen and do some math instead of just, you know, setting a certain width and, you know, do some division. It's, it sucks, but it's well worth it. And there's some good libraries out there that help do this for you, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you can probably set it up so it doesn't get too small and stuff like that, or... <laughs> use all kinds of different things. But the one thing you shouldn't do is assume that because it looks a specific way on your screen, it will look the same way on others. Because I know from, I think it was one of my good buddies, he uses a 4K screen and he doesn't have any type of text size help. He turns it off completely. And that means that the stuff on his screen is minuscule. It's very small, but he can see it. He can read it just fine. And he has better than 2020 vision, apparently, the doctors say. But it makes sure that he has all the needed room for whatever he needs to do on the screen. So he doesn't like it getting any bigger than that. And that's just the user that you can't expect there to be because most people would probably have the text at 150% or whatever. So yeah, you can't assume anything there either. Yeah. Let's say, do you want to take the next one, Joe, or should I take that one? I think it's you. Okay. So, uh, five, use relative paths, right? We, we kind of covered it with using the built-in variables and stuff like that. But again, don't 
expect stuff to just be where you expect it to be, right? It, if people have installed uh, or put your script in a specific place, use paths that are relative to that location, right? Instead of saying, put a folder here this way uh, or make two subfolders or whatever, make sure that you actually take care to figure out either where it's stored or how to traverse from one point to the other instead of making hard named specific uh, paths in your script. I, and here I thought I was supposed to use like my dad or sister's path. So I'm glad you explained that to me because I was very confused there for a moment. Um, the the uh, number six here, we were talking about uh, using, uh, make sure you use, include required libraries and functions. Now this, comes up with a lot of people will share things and they forget to pack up the functions that they have in libraries or they, they have libraries in their default library and they didn't, you know, in, include those. That's one of the things I love about Studio. Uh, you can say publish to bring up the thing and say publish and it will go get everything you need for that script and put it all together in one file on your clipboard that then you can put it wherever or you can post it to like a post bin. Uh, but that it's a really great functionality because if you're doing a good job developing and compartmentalizing your functions and putting them in different files, um, it can be very painful to, you know, to go and pack these all, you know, to, you have to create a zip file, I guess, usually is most, what most people would do, uh, but maybe you don't want all the files that are in that folder. So that can be really time consuming and confusing. So, um, but definitely make sure you go through and include that because I see it so many on the forum, right? People share stuff. They're like, it won't work because of this. Oh, well, yeah, I should have shared that library or you have to go get it. You have to go get it. And, and I don't even give you a resource, right? It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And, and often it's, it's probably an old thing without a hotkey. Uh, I'm not sure how other languages are doing the same thing, but because we have three options for a shared folder, or, or, or shared library location. So you have um, the location where the script is stored, you have in my documents, and you have uh, where our hotkey is stored. You have the option to store files named after the functions that you use in your scripts. So someone who's used to their own setup, they could have quite an extensive library in their um, relative shared library on their computer and they wouldn't even think about um, that being something people won't have. And one of the things I've seen with more than anything, I think, is the GDI plus library. Yeah, It sure. is probably the one that I've seen. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the one I've seen the most being an issue where people would have shared something that either looks good or does something fancy or is able to manipulate whatever you see on screen quite well. And people try to run it and they immediately figure out that they don't have the GDI plus library. And it's a big library. Yes, and right. it was frequently updated. And therefore it made little sense for people to keep sharing it. And mm -hmm. That's why, as you said, Joe, a lot of people would say, oh, you need to go and get that one. But yeah, if, if people linked to it when they shared it or made sure to include it, yeah, because sometimes it's not smart to have people go and get the newest version because right. it might not be compatible with whatever you made. So, right. Which is a good point of, you know, it often is better to include your your known working version of that library instead of hoping someone doesn't update it and things break. Um, a funny story real quickly, Jackie, on this whole concept of auto hockey will automatically search in those three places you described, right? I was talking to Isaiah one day and uh, he didn't know what auto hockey did that, right? Hmm. He's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, you don't have to use an include, blah, blah. And he's like, that's crazy. And I showed him and he's like, but that's so dangerous because then you're, you're not, how would I know that you're in, using those library? And I'm like, yeah, but it's a great feat. I, I view it as a great feature and he viewed it, which I am totally understand his perspective of like how kind of 
dangerous it is because then how would you know I don't have that library, that function or whatever, you know, here. Um, and what he did actually say was version two actually locked that down, that you, it will no longer do that. You have to use includes in version two, apparently. It, it, that functionality predates all of the, the big oh. uh, computer sharing and version control things you have available today. Back then, it was seen as a convenience. You can place all of the stuff that you get to other hotkey in a specific folder, and then you just have it. Then, then you don't need to keep track of having everything. But today, with how one actually wants to come, come, oh, yeah. Um, you you want to have every script working separately and having all the stuff yeah. compartmentalized. Yeah, exactly. You know, when I was programming with Python for a couple of years, I was trying to learn it and do stuff. And there was one thing that really annoyed me about Python was all the different libraries I'd have, to get, but then also you'd have to get another download of Python and put it in its own environment with its own um did they call them like maybe they call them libraries? Well, there was another term they used for them as well, though. Module, and, uh, modules, or something. modules. Okay, and it was just crazy how many different installs of Python I ended up having in different you know things. But that was part of the reasoning was well, people would update the the libraries that were it was dependent on, and you were better getting a local copy of it for then and there and now. And I know it works instead of yeah. you know hoping it. But um, yeah, it was. A blessing and a curse, I suppose. Um. Yeah. And the seventh one here is testing, right? It, it's if you're sharing your th thing or if you're moving it from computer to computer, testing, if, don't just assume that it works. Test it on other versions of Windows, test it on different resolutions, whichever is needed, right? If, if, if you're the one controlling the resolution and you know that you have the same one on all four, sure, you still test it because other, it wasn't, wouldn't work. But if you actually make something that it's supposed to work on different resolutions, try and test that. If you're making something and you're claiming it to work on multiple versions of Windows, at least test it. Right? It's, it's, it's a very simple thing, just not if you want to use it on multiple computers, at least test it on more than one computer before. Yeah, and actually, I would even stress everything you say and a little bit more in that have a couple test, not you, right? Have a couple other people that you know, um, have them test it on their computers because people think differently than you do. And before you share it, we did this with one of our tools the other day, I, I was telling him, we're ready to, you know, we're getting ready to share this. And he's like, oh, so we'll go put it, you know, out as a download. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm going to first give it to like two people and ask them to just run it for a couple of days. Just tell us if there's anything crazy. And sure enough, we found something very obvious, which was, it was great. But that saved us this whole round of putting it out, you know, in the, uh, uh, the, the, the world and having a lot of people have all those issues to that, right? We just did a little pre-testing with a couple people. And again, it's really important that, they don't think like you, right? Besides having different actual computers, people do crazy stuff. You know, at least it, it feels like it's crazy because they just think differently than we do. So it's really good to have someone else try it out. Um, I can't stress that enough. Absolutely. Um, the last one, it, we do have a bonus one kind of here because, but it really, it, it's, you know, hey, you know what? It depends a lot on who you're going to give it to. And with, especially, this is the, the blessing with auto hockey compared to a lot of other languages. I'd say, you know, compiling your script is a great, easy way. If you're going to give it to people who are not computer friendly, you know, not techie, compiling your script is a great, simple way to reduce your headaches um, and make sure that you, know, you give them what they need. Yeah, and with with a lot of the the newer um, functionality with well with compiling, both with including and uh, different types of resources and stuff like that. Yeah, if if you're sharing it with someone you don't know or you don't know the skill level of and stuff like that, I'd also say compile it if it makes sense and 
In other cases, if you're sharing it with your colleague on the next table or the, the office over, whatever, yeah, and you know that they already have our hotkey from the last thing you shared with them. Keep it as a script. That's fair enough. But yeah, compile when when that makes the best sense. Absolutely. Yeah, and and actually spot on, Jackie, on that one, because sometimes it's it's the other thing is like those people that I had test, the little thing I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, of course I didn't compile it because they're they use auto hockey, but they actually dug in and you know proposed some of the issues, right, for me. So like this is where hey, if, if you can actually have someone else kind of help you, it's awesome, right? You don't have to necessarily fix everything. They, they might have a few minutes. They might try to fix it for you and explain, you know, because, which I know, Jackie, you're very familiar with this one. Troubleshooting something that you don't have the issue on your computer is just a freaking nightmare, right? Yeah. It's, so, it's, it's impossible, really. So um, what I usually tell people, too, is if people are reporting bugs, do a video of it. That, that'll, it makes it so much easier if you record a video and show me what's happening instead of trying to describe it. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, very cool. Awesome, man. Well, thank you. And don't forget to like, please like and share the podcast. Thank you yeah, so much. Absolutely. Tell your friends, tell your mom, all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, Jackie. Yeah, bye.